Welcome to Colonial Classics, a food demonstration with the House of the Seven Gables, live in the Gables Cafe kitchen. Tonight, we're going to do something a little different and have a conversation about the history of tea with the Gables Collections Manager, Susan Baker. The House of the Seven Gables strives to be a welcoming, thriving historic site and community resource that engages people of all backgrounds in our inclusive American story. Continuing this work, takes effort, time, and money. We would like to thank our members who are here tonight and invite you to become a member if you're not. We have some great programs and member events lined up this year. We have included a link for membership in the chat. We have also included a link for donation to help us cover the costs of this demonstration and to support our work as a community resource. Any amount is greatly appreciated. We encourage you to support, support small businesses in your, your community whenever you can. We purchased our spice collection from Salem Spice on Pickering Wharf and our tea was donated to us by Jolie Tea. I would personally like to thank all the people who have supported this program and got it running safely during COVID-19, especially Julie Harrison Bishop and Deb Costa who are here again with me as my support crew. If you have a question or comment at any time during the demonstration, please type it into the chat and it'll be read aloud to Susan and me. The goal of this demonstration is to connect with everyone so do not be afraid to engage in the chat, either with us or with each other. Now, who's ready to get started? Hi, guys. Just gonna have that. We're all set. All right, great. How's everyone doing? Does everyone have some tea maybe or, or something? Yeah, everyone's got it. <laughs> kind of interested in what, whatever you guys have today. I'll, I'll show you what, what I have in a second. Um, so as Julie's going over to read the comments, I'll introduce um, Susan Baker right here. Hi everyone. Um, she's our collections manager here at the Gables and she's gonna show us some really amazing artifacts that I have just been nerding out about <laughs> in the past <laughs> weeks. She showed me some pictures. Um, so Julie, anyone have any tea? There are, there are many people with teacups. Um, yeah. Looks like they're enjoying everyone with us. Great. Good. Fairies tea from Ireland. Lemon singer. Ooh. Lemon singer, interesting. All right, so today our tea is donated by Julie Tea, which is right down the street from us. It's a great place where I go get all my loose leaf tea. Um, and this is actually our Caroline Emerton um, tea blend. It was called Sweet Caroline Emerton Blend, and it is, I need to read the cheat sheets, all right, it's a um, Sri Lankan black tea with vanilla bean, rose petals, lavender, and vanilla essence. Um, and Amy, who is in charge over at Jolie Tea, she told me that the inspiration for it was the gardens, especially the roses and that lavender. Um, so she really wanted to take a piece of the garden and put it into some tea. And named after our founder, Carolyn Emerson. Yeah, that's, that. that is an important thing. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, so since we're doing it in this pot right here, um, I have my little cheat sheet that I actually got at Julie's Tea. They give you this little thing. So that way you have the right ratio to water, which is very important to making sure your coffee is, your coffee, your tea <laughs> isn't too watery or too strong, strong whatever works. So we're gonna use, so in here we have 16 ounces of water. And so that means we need two teaspoons. If I can get it out. And it's really, so we're using some loose leaf tea, which I hopefully will not spill everywhere. Not very good. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. All right. And then get some of that rose petal in there. It looks good. I can see the yeah. glass of lavender. Well, Oh my gosh, you can. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can see that. Got it? Oh, over here. See that? Just plop it in there. Looks lovely. 
and got some on the plate. That's why we have the plate. There you go. And then, yeah, it smells really nice. And I have this handy dandy, we're just gonna, it's hot, so we're gonna put that in there. And then we're gonna have it steep for eight minutes. Eight minutes on the clock. <laughs> I should probably put it in there. Julie's got it good because I don't have a clock. Uh, <laughs> all right, so while that is steeping, um, we don't have that. We have our crackles and our marmalade here. So we'll have those once our tea is all ready to go. Um, in the meantime, we'll have, you guys notice we have our lovely, our lovely little teacups that aren't historical, so we can we can use them. Um, but Susan's brought down some a really, really great piece that gives us. Sure. So um, I'm sure. All of you have seen this kind of blue and white Chinese looking um, serving ware that, that is very popular and has been very popular for many years. But I want to show you some of the original, um, an example of an original one, which is from China from the um, late, late 1700s. And um, it's a beautiful willowware pattern uh, from Nanking, the Nanking region. And has um, gilding along the edging. It's very fancy. And um, this is called Chinese export wear. So one of the reasons that Salem became so famous and prosperous was due to importing, uh, sea captains importing this kind of material to sell here in Salem. Um, it was um, sold to the wealthy and the rising middle class who had leisure time on hands and also servants so that they could um, have tea parties and have time to drink a leisurely cup of tea, um, which is what we're kind of doing today, oh, which is lovely. Yeah. It's really great. <laughs> I haven't had a tea um, party in forever. So one thing you might note is that this cup does not have a handle, unlike the cups that we use. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> and um, actually, Chinese tea cups also didn't have handles. That was a Western, um, something that was developed to sell to the West. Exactly. There's our tea handle. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so that if you have a really old piece of Chinese export teaware, it will not have a handle on it. So if you have any of those in your house stash somewhere, now you know why it doesn't have a handle. Um, anything else I should add about that? Oh, so I should mention one that's in the... This is a piece that's usually located in our parlor in the um, House of the Seven Gables in the Turner Ingersoll Mansion. Um, we have a little tea table set up, so it's over there. And I should mention porcelain too. So one of the other things that sea captains were bringing back from China was porcelain. It was highly um, valued by the West because it's super thin and you can design, um, you can have many, many colors on it. If you think about what colonial people were using, they were using wood or they were using um, redware, stoneware, um, pottery, which was super breakable, couldn't really be um, decorated with many colors. And, um, and this was just seen as like a huge, kind of an advancement and every, everybody wanted porcelain, um, porcelain tea services and, tea and, and eating services. I, I want a set very much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't think I can get that nice gold yeah. edging thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I never noticed, I've given how many tours in the parlor and I never noticed that it didn't have um, a, handle. a handle. There you go. How did I miss that? Well, there's oh, some in there that do have handles, so you might have just not noticed it. It's a detail. But it's yeah, kind I'm of just going to go and, and see. Yeah, so the next time you guys come on a tour, come in, <laughs> check out in the parlor. Um, feel free to ask which one uh, to see if there's any that have any handles. Should we have any questions about the our a nice little tea cup? Nothing not yet. Yeah, not, no tea cup. Okay, that's good. Um, I lost my train of thought. History of tea. History of tea. Yeah. yeah. Let's, okay. So we were talking about China. Let's go. So full disclosure, I don't. It's very difficult to get the full history of tea because it is thousands of years old, going across multiple different cultures. Tea did originate in China. That's where we've been able to trace it back to. But from there, it kind of just exploded to a number of different countries in the area before making its way over to um, Europe. So originally in, originally in China, it started out as sort of a tea brick that was bound together with a rice paste. So that way it would stay together and you have to grind it up um, to use this powder. And then gradually it would evolve to just using the, so sorry, the tea brick is made of the tea leaf. Oh, no, no, originally it was made with 
ground tea. Was ground tea. That rice based. Yes. That was the very early. That was the very early right. one. And then gradually, I think they, they bind the leaves without making them into a powder. Right. So there's a huge evolution going, spanning from, let me get my cheat sheet. What's the earliest year I have in here? Um, because there's, there's, like I said, thousands of years. So the Tang Dynasty in 618, that is the earliest one. That's the steamed green bricks containing rice paste as a binding agent. And then about 300 years later, they still have the green bricks, but they're not using the rice paste. They want it more pure, just purely sticking together without any additives uh, with it. So that's about 300 years later. And then yeah, then it just keeps, it keeps going until we have sort of tea today. And so that's in China. And then it spreads over to Japan around, it becomes popular in Japan around late 1100s. So I think where I've been able to, to trace it back to a little bit, um, a little bit beforehand because the priests and noble, noblemen were able to afford and be able to, to transport it, but they used it more as a medicine. It wasn't a leisure thing like we know it today. Um, and so it only became a little bit more popular after it started to be, tea was starting to be grown in Japan. There were some Buddhist priests that had gone to visit China and then they brought it back, some seeds to Japan. And that's how it became more popular over there. And then we have our Japanese um, tea ceremony that I don't know, there's, there's so many different parts to that and procedures just for the host and then procedures and etiquette for the guest. And it's a very beautiful ceremony that um, we could go on for hours talking about, which we don't have because we haven't even talked about Indian tea, uh, which is where we go next on sort of like this, this tea trip. And that's kind of the, the connection. So Tea in India, again, comes originally from, from China, so spreading downward. I know that's backwards for you guys, but it makes sense when I'm pointing my fingers. Um, <laughs> and so it becomes popular. And then we have our chai tea, which actually I now know that saying chai tea is basically me just saying tea tea, because chai means tea, which I did not know before this research. Uh, the tea, the chai that we know more of today would be described in India as marsala chai. And so masala chai is a mixture of the black tea with, was it black tea? It was black tea. Let me check. Hold on, before I give you guys any information. Yep, black tea, there we go. Chai was originally black tea steamed or boiled in milk. So they would make it all together instead of water. And so that made your chai. And then adding spices such as cardamom, cinnamon, clove. Yeah, adding those in, that made it marsala chai. So you it's very different. Somebody on the call who's actually visited a tea park in India. Oh my oh, gosh, yes. that's great. Yeah. How cool, yeah. Very nice, any any fun stories? Um, yeah, chai, yeah, and so. And somebody who has participated in a Japanese tea ceremony as well. Oh my goodness. I must, so participated? So you had all the rules along with it. Like I had a, I had one of my coworkers, he, he wanted to learn how to do it, but there's like it would take too long to teach you. That depends on what time. So the question was, would the, the tea come over in a brick or loose? So that really depends on the time period. So I think I think mostly if it depends if you're talking about tea that came here, mm -hmm. it was loose, but you might want to talk about kind of English, how it got to England and the yes. colonies, and then we can talk about yes. the loose and the brick tea. Yes. So India is sort of how it comes over a little bit. It's a mixture. So originally actually coming into Europe, the English were not the first to be transporting tea. Um, might've made it into the, the fa tea, make, made tea famous like it is today, but it wasn't the first country that actually had tea in Europe. It was the Portuguese. And so that is how the Portuguese were, were trading up in India and Asia, bringing it over. And then gradually the, the Dutch came and then it was the English who were fighting sort of, not exactly fighting, but trying to trade over in that area, the East, um, sorry, the East, China, East India Trading Company, who were, oh, my teeth are um, who were, then that's how that started, because they wanted that monopoly of um, 
it was very lucrative to trade in tea and the other things that the Chinese and other Asian companies were offering, different kinds of woods, porcelain, tea, and silk also. And um, so these European countries were vying for access to those markets so they could bring it back and sell. And the British became um, predominant um, eventually. Mm -hmm. And then it came to the American colonies. And um, one of the things that we show in when, when tours are given, do you want me to talk about tea right now? Yeah, you do. So I want to show you a picture. I'm going to take, I'm, I'm, if you guys want to see the, the okay. color, it actually looks really close to, the, um, to our, our marmalade. That they saw the, a tea brick, the first time they saw right. a tea brick was at the witch house. At the, the witch house has a tea yes. brick? I'm going to go check that out. Yep, so we have, this is this is our tea, it's a black tea, so you can see that by the color. And now I'm gonna try it, so I'm just gonna... It's delicious. It's really good. It really does have that kind of other flavor besides just yeah. tea in there, it's really good. Yeah. Yeah, so if you guys are in the, want to be on the Jolie tea. <laughs> Grab some Edmonton tea, it's delicious. It's so good. It's so good. Um, this is my first time ever trying it. I, People for months have been telling me about this joke about the, this Emerton tea, and I just hadn't got a chance to actually go and try it. Oh, and there's the, the bit of vanilla in there. It's really it's tasty. And if you talk about what's on the table for the yeah, we have our our cracknels and our marmalette. So those of you who were with us in April, we have our cracknels right here, which I've made again. So those weird sort of uh, how do I spice? Yes, yeah, the, the spiced baby bagels, the precursor bagels that I talked about that you have to boil and then bake um, with all these really great spices in them. So they have cinnamon, nutmeg, clove, and aniseed. And then we'll pairing with it, pairing with it is our pear marmalette, which you guys were here in May. Yep, I know my months, I do. Um, that's what we made during that time. So marmalette being a precursor to marmalade it has those chunks in there and i think they go very well together we've been munching on them they're before. delicious <laughs> they're delicious you should try them make them at home yes yeah definitely try them out did anyone try the cracknels or the marmalette between now yeah, has anyone tried those i will let you know if anybody is which you have okay so <laughs> while you're eating right, I'm, I'm, just, right. I'm just gonna talk about about tea here um, in the colonies when, when um, tea was first started to be imported here uh, as part of the British colonies. So um, tea was not brought as in bricks here. It was brought as loose tea that was packed. And the PBDS Museum has this amazing image uh, print that I want to show you um, that shows Western sea captains, you can see them, um, doing business with Chinese merchants. And you can see the tea boxes and in the background, my favorite part is all the men who are standing in the boxes, boxes stomping down the loose tea leaves so that it's compacted and they can fit more in for transport to the to Western countries. Can, can you see that? Yeah, thank you. And you can see the Western, um, sorry, pointing out the Western guys. Sure, so there's, yeah. oops, so we're gonna back you up just a bit. Okay. So there's Western over here and then Western yeah. over here. And then standing. Sitting down, making there's some business. Yeah. And there's a whole series of these kind of prints that show the process from growing the tea to picking the tea to preparing the tea to um, roasting the tea to packing the tea. It's, it's really great. But that's how tea would come to this country, packed in crates. And um, we talked about the tea brick before. That was not widely available here at all. But let me just grab this. Oh, I'm just getting my um, gloves on. Hold on. Need the gloves. Yes. Yeah, the Peabody Essex Museum has a huge collection of Asian artifacts. Um, Chinese export. Chinese export. Yeah. Um, so it's really it's really worth a visit. visit. In fact, yeah. they have the largest collection of Chinese export and Asian export art in, in the world. Um, I was aware. So it's pretty impressive. But here is a tea brick. Um, I don't know if you can see that. Can you can everybody see that? Okay, so as you can see, it's pressed and pressed in a, in a mold that gives it this decoration. This one um, is from the 1820s, and um, we have it in our um, dining room chamber as part of our tour of the gables. Um, 
And when we talk about um, the wealth, the maritime wealth that helped create um, create Salem as a wealthy city, including the Turner Ingersoll Mansion, that's one of the reasons it was built. So this is made out of tea that's been chopped up and compressed, chopped up into fine. It's not powdered, but it's fine. You can see the little pieces of it, but I don't know if you'll be able to see that. This is one of my favorite things to talk about when we're when I, when I give a tour because I always like to stump people. I'm like, does anyone know what this thing is? And they're like, iron. It's for printing. And I'm like, it's something you can consume. And they go, chocolate. I'm like, no. <laughs> it's it's great. We've had visitors who um, who speak and read Chinese yes. and who have um, translated this for us, which I can't remember what it what it says. Oh, um, it says the company. Right? Yeah, China. It says China Tea Company something Incorporated. Um, it's in traditional Chinese, and the person that on my tour that that translated it, her father spoke traditional Chinese, so she was able to figure it out a little bit. And actually, if you want to pick it up again, I can point out which one meant. I think it was the. Oh, how many servings are in this table? I have zero idea. No oh, idea. No idea about that. Oh. That's many. The um, back so of it. I'm sorry. The back of it. You can see that like there's like perfect. Mm, there's indentations, so yeah. it looks like you could break it up into into those kinds of little blocks. Yeah. But what were you most yeah, sure? yeah, yeah. So the I believe it was called Middle Kingdom is how China referred to itself. Yeah. And that is in this symbol right here. So actually I'm gonna move it forward. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move it. That way we can try and see. Hey, Susan, can you move that up just a little bit? No. Can anyone see that one right there? So it's sort of a square with a line through it. And that's what one of the people told me is. Indicates China. Indicates China, China, yeah, or or how China referred to itself at that time. So that's we'll see. And and, yeah, uh, well, no, but I, I think the the I don't know how many servings you could get out of this, but I'm assuming that these these blocks in the back you could kind of break into those yeah. chunks, and then you would maybe that would be a teapot worth of tea. I don't, I don't know because you have to smash it up in order to actually you do you have to you grind, you have to grind yeah. it up because yeah. you don't just put the whole brick in there or even like just it in brick. Any like sort of brick form, it has to be mashed up into into the powder. powder, powder. Yeah. But so one thing that so um, so as I mentioned, these were not widely used or available in the U.S. Um, but so it was loose tea, like the tea that we just made. But let me show you this other thing called a tea caddy. Thank you, the tea caddy. Hey, the tea caddy. I am <laughs> So this is a um, a beautiful. Um, lacquered tea caddy with um, it made out of it's brown lacquer with gold decoration um, hand painted on and in Boston and it's if you can see inside it's got a black lacquer inside it's not in great shape it has a lot of condition issues but it has beautiful um, little scenes of boys and girls and men and women playing and fishing and farming and doing things like that um, and it also has these little Chinese, I don't can't tell if it's a lion or a dog, yeah. which is a which is a potent symbol in Chinese um, iconography. So it means you know the fortune and other things. Um, which I forgot my Chinese. Like, <laughs> yes. know better. This would have had originally um, uh, pewter or silver canisters in here. So tea was for wealthy people initially, and later for. Um, the more middle classes that was emerging in the U.S. Here's a, oh, so yeah, here, so here's, here's one split up. So this is one that we sell actually in the museum store um, that you we have. And so as you can see inside, it has that silver silver. So that keeps it nice and fresh. And these would be. Um, oh yeah, here we go. I didn't even know this was contained. Contained. It would be contained. It would be contained. They were airtight. There it is. Yeah, airtight. So that way the tea would stay fresh for longer and then you could mix it in this middle section right here so you store and then you'd mix it with your water um, and so yeah we have lots of lots of tea space in here this is our bigger one we do have a smaller one available in the shop, yeah. the shop. <laughs> but the, um so this might have had those contained compartments and it might have just had inserts that would have been uh silver or pewter kind of a metal insert um and tea was expensive and uh, so it was kind of like spices. They were, they were kind of controlled carefully and the woman of the household would have had the key to this and it would have stayed locked. And um, it wasn't something that they wanted anybody to be able to 
access. So that's the, the development of a T-caddy to keep it fresh and also to keep it um, secure. And I think we can give at least a basic answer for the tea brick and how many servings question. Okay. So uh, the servings would be based on weight and to make an eight ounce cup of tea, you would use anywhere from three to five grams of what would be in the tea brick. So probably what would equal out to about a small shaving of it. So if your tea brick weighs about a pound and a half, you would get about 230 servings of tea out of one brick of tea. Thank you. Thank God for Google, right? right? <laughs> Thank you. That's amazing. So I'm going to take this back from the way. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. And, and there's examples of tea caddies all over the place. So you might have one in your own house. Uh, you might see it in a museum. You might see it at antique stores. They are, um, they are readily available because people don't really use tea the way, the way they used to. Um, so one of the reasons tea was so expensive, here, if we're going to rearrange our table here, um, is because of the monopoly sort of that the British East it East India um, Company had. And so for a very long time, in order to get tea over to the colonies, it had to go from China, from like ship from China or India, wherever it was coming from, to England, and then from England over to the colonies. It wasn't able to go directly. And then after that, revolution. Um, after, yeah, and then around, I think just before the revolution, it was allowed for the, the company to trade directly with um, with the Americas, and that's where we got some issues because then they started overtaxing the tea because apparently it wasn't as expensive. If you went directly from point A to point B instead of A, B, and C, just A to B is a lot cheaper, and so you can tax it more, I guess, is what kind of happened. I think that's an oversimplification of it, but that's how we start getting the Boston Tea Party going on over here. And then after the revolution, American. Um, and maritime merchants like the sea captains who lived in Salem started pursuing direct trade with China and and, um, and trading partners there. So the middleman was taken out, England was taken out, and they were able to make unbelievable amounts of money bringing tea and other items from China in here into the colonies. No, no longer colonies. Into the oh, country. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Any questions? Okay. We're going to go kind of a little forward in time to talk about the room that we're in for a sec, because we are in um, actually the original tea room at the House of Seven Gables. So this door actually used to be able to open and it would lead you outside onto where there would be an arbor and you'd have your tea out there. And we actually have a picture of that. This Three photograph three. is from 1920 and it shows um, some ladies enjoying tea outside of the door that we're currently yeah. sitting in. The doors. You right can see here. the eye of Arbor, and the lady, um, the woman in in um, uniform serving them. It was very popular. We actually have one photograph which we did not bring up um, that shows the the whole lawn completely filled with people and tables and chairs. Oh, it's pretty cool. And this one is from 1938. Sorry, Julie. It's okay. Nineteen thirty-eight, also showing the tea room and. Um, the tea room, and that's actually the door. So if you guys are coming to visit us, you go in through our front door of our visitor services um, visitor center, and then you go out these double doors. So before there were the double doors, there was just the one door with two big windows, and that's how you go out onto the area to have have your tea. And there, we have a really great. We have many little fabulous treasures in our collection, including a sign that um, has a note in it that was handwritten by Carolyn Emerson, our founder. This is from about, excuse me, let me grab it. Um, I think 1928, I, I can't remember the date on this, but this shows a picture of the gables and the gardens. And then I'll, I'll read you these, it's great. It's, um, this is an advertisement for the garden and for the tea room. So what it says is, I'll put it back down in a sec. The tea room and the garden, is open from 12 to 7.30, Sundays included. Chicken dinners, four courses, uh, $1.75. Special luncheons, $1. Also service a la carte, afternoon tea, cold drinks, fresh homemade candy, uh, and then no admission to the tea room for those, oh, free admission to the tea room for those intending to patronize the entire property. Enter through the shop. 
So, oh my gosh, isn't that the greatest? So that used to hang outside here, and we believe that was written by her. It's in her handwriting. It's in, uh, Caroline Everton's handwriting. That's awesome. Yeah. So we have we have quite a history of tea on this site, too. which I think is really great. Not to mention all the people who lived here who who were wealthy enough and had enough leisure time, so they were consuming tea frequently um, in their houses, in their homes. Yeah. Do you think so, so one question that came in is what country consumes the most tea? What country consumes the most tea? But somebody tea? via a quick Google search on the chat said that it seems that Turkey might be the country that's what I heard. Turkey is interesting. Because in my research, I was I was trying to see other places where there was tea, and it seemed like coffee was more in Turkey. Because I was looking at sort of Middle Eastern tea area, and it seemed like the Middle East was having a lot of coffee coming in from Turkey. Well, they did have a lot of sweet, they drink a lot of sweet tea there. Mm -hmm. Strong sweet tea. I don't know. Have you? Have we have hosted it? We hosted it. Oh. We haven't. Not Wouldn't that be fun to do? Back in the 90s, I mean, they used to have the tea service, they do tea, uh, but they you can come closer and, and speak to the, the county. <laughs> want to. People do not have the time for a long, luxurious afternoon tea. Would love I'd to have the time. time. I know. Time. I would love to have the time. Just prepping for this tea, though, took me a while. I'm just going to lay back in this chair. <laughs> Is everyone enjoying their tea? I'm enjoying mine. It's almost gone. Should we show them anything from the shop? I know that you saw that in the beginning, but we have a lot of really great. And there, there is definitely some feedback that we should absolutely be hosting. Tea. Absolutely be hosting a tea. Wow. Well, there you go. I think we can look into that. I think we're going to look into that. Maybe I think I definitely will. Maybe for Ms. Yeah. Anderson's birthday. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be a nice community event. Oh, actually, Karen Pelletier did a tea here as Miss Everton. Oh, somebody. Oh, somebody somebody, somebody was like dressed as Miss Everton. That's so fun. Yes, yeah, so someone dressed as Miss Everton. I, I'm You've inspired us, everybody. Yes. Yeah. Oh, so many plans. Yay. Um, all right, so I think we'll do last questions because guys that that's a half hour we could sit here for hours and hours but we gotta drive home <laughs> we have to clean up uh, one of the questions is there is the recipe for the marmalade and crackers online those i believe the the recipes are on our facebook those were posted on our facebook when they came out so if you go scrolling through our our facebook you'll be able to find those little them yeah <laughs> Yeah, it all came really together. I, I, I didn't know anything about the, the Emerton tea, but it actually pairs pretty well, especially because we have the, the spices and then the very sweet marmalade, and then you have that sort of not exactly bitter, but it's it's a it's a black tea, so it's that nice it's taste sort strong. of knocks it out strong. It has a um it has you know oomph to it, it's not just a it's now a it's great. even stronger because I forgot to take out the <laughs> so that that can be pretty strong. I'm gonna take that out now. Actually, it's really good with the um with these um crackers or or whatever they are. Yeah, bagel crackles. Bagels. Yeah, bagels. Um, they're it's delicious. I still don't know exactly what they are, but they're supposed to be. They were in the bread section of the of the um of the cookbook. But yeah. Uh, Oh, there's a museum that does a high tea, a cream tea once a month, and then they do a high tea for Mother's Day. Oh, high tea. But but a, what kind of high tea are there? There's actually, the high tea that we know isn't actually a British high tea. So yeah, I haven't even gone into tea time. So we have our 11 C's. Oh, okay. For so those of you who are um, Hobbit fans, um, Lord <laughs> so there are different kinds of tea times depending on where you are. Let's see. Oh, yes. Okay. So for English tea times, there's 11 Z's, which is brunch at 11. There's afternoon tea, which is called low tea because the women were sitting in low couches um, when they were having them. And then high tea. So afternoon tea is actually the tea that we think of as high tea. High tea actually used to be, it, it originated in the lower classes. Um, it was taken after work and it had a heavy meal so it didn't have the little finger sandwiches that was low tea that was your afternoon tea I so it's like tea sorry like, to ruin it guys it's like dinner basically that that dinner, yeah. 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 yeah it's coming out of um because a lot of this started around the industrial industrial revolutions when tea really becomes more popular with everyday people they're able to afford it 
um, and have, and even if they don't really have that time, it's something they can quickly have by going to a tea room, coffee shop, and having a quick tea. So Susan, someone wants to know what your favorite collection is at the Gables. Oh my gosh. Ooh. <laughs> That's a really tough question. Like picking a favorite child. Yeah, that would be like picking a favorite child. I, um, I would have to say a portrait, uh, a, a painting by Sophia Peabody, who was Nathaniel Hawthorne's wife, but who was one of the famous Peabody sisters at Salem. Um, she was very, came from a very intellectual, highly educated family, and she was a painter. And she was really one of America's, we're kind of discovering this now, um, the small group of, of institutions that have her, any of her art, because there's very little left, um, that she was really a very fine artist and one and one of America's first commercial artists, which has been pretty much unsung up, up to now, but is she's starting to be recognized as that because she was being she was painting to make money um, to support herself because she was sickly, mostly because she lived in a very domineering family and that was her coping mechanism. As soon as she moved out, she became fine. But the painting is called "The Flight into Egypt" and it's a spectacular, huge landscape um, that we just apply for a grant to get conserved because it's in pretty bad shape. So we're hoping that we get the money to conserve it and to put it in a period appropriate frame and then we'll highlight it in the in the house yeah. um, once that's done. Oh, great. Because right now it's hanging up in our Nathaniel Hoffman birthplace house, which is going to be open. For those of you who have come to visit, you could only get into any of the houses if you had tickets. But now if you're in the garden, if you do our garden experience, you can get into the Nathaniel Hoffman birthplace house starting on Friday. So we're very excited about that. And it's upstairs, um, direct that first one when you go upstairs, hanging above the fireplace. You know, they see what bad shape it's in. So, um, <laughs> yes, but it's still a beautiful piece. It's, I do enjoy that. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's it's my pet um, project to get that, that painting served because it's just, it deserves it. And she deserves recognition as not just Nathaniel Hoffer's wife, but as an artist in her own right. So um, so I love it. I love it. That's that's probably my favorite, but there are lots of others I could pick out of the hat. So. So many things. All right. Questions. Questions. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for our, our tea, which I guess we'll call late afternoon tea. It's, it's almost it's actually a high tea. It was delicious. <laughs> um, we're hoping to bring colonial classics back when it becomes colder weather. Um, so enjoy the summer and thank you so much for joining us. Hope you guys have a great rest of your summer. Bye, everybody. Bye.